We're going to take a couple of minutes to make sure that we let the majority of people in before we get started. Benedict, I've just muted Pen Penny. I can see our participants trickling well up now, uh, Louise. Uh, we'll give it another few minutes. Okay. I think Zoom always takes a few minutes to kind of load on my computer. It's always a bit of a slow start. Yeah, there's a time when it does the little bubbling thing. Mm. To people just joining us, you're very welcome. We're going to give us another couple of minutes uh, before I have the great pleasure of introducing uh, Professor Louise Dye. Who I know has a lot to say, so we, 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 we don't want to start too late. And say it quickly. saw 50 there for a minute, but we went back down to 49. <laughs> Everybody, you're very welcome. Okay, so I'll, I'll get started with a boring bit, which is introducing uh, myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Bernadette Moore, and I'm an Associate Professor uh, of Obesity in the School of uh, Food Science and Nutrition here at the University of Leeds. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this, which is our fourth virtual seminar in the Global Food and Environment Institute's um, seminar series. And today um, we're going to hear from Professor Louise Dye on the implications of food security in terms of nutrition for ac academic and cognitive uh, performance and nutritional status of children and adolescents. Just to remind you, especially anybody who's joining us for the first time, uh, the Global Food and Environment Institute is an interdisciplinary uh, research community here at the University of Leeds, and it brings together um, members from across academia, industry, and importantly, public policy, which uh, we're privileged uh, to have Professor Dai uh, speak with us uh, today, um, and focusing on the integrated challenges of food security and climate um, change. Um, so the seminar today is part of a series and we've pushed into the chat function uh, the, the link and throughout uh, Louise's talk please do push into the chat uh, your questions and I will kind of condense these and, and convey uh, them to Louise uh, when she has, has finished. Um, lastly, uh, you've seen on the slide the Zoom etiquette, so let me please remind you of that and also uh, that we are uh, being uh, recorded. So I'll now introduce uh, Professor Louise Dye. Um, it is, in fact, an honor and a privilege uh, to be asked uh, to do so. Uh, she is the N8 Agri-Food Chair uh, here at the University of Leeds, as well as Professor of Nutrition and Behavior uh, in our Human Appetite uh, Research Unit, which is based in our School of uh, Psychology. And she is, along with uh, Professor Steve Banworth, the academic lead for the N8 Agri-Food Programme here at the University of Leeds. Um, she holds numerous uh, board and chairing positions, including uh, chairing a, a group on neuroscience and mental health uh, for the BB. BBSRC Strategy Board. Uh, for the BBSRC, she also is a member of uh, their drink steering group, which interacts very closely um, with, with industry. Um, she's going to tell us about her uh, research. Um, she has published numerous very significant papers uh, in this field. And her, along with uh, that of her uh, close uh, uh, collaborator, uh, Katie, her data has been used uh, by members of parliament in terms of considering uh, uh, the 
breakfast food uh, bill. Um, and I was looking up her papers and uh, some of these have been cited hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, and in fact, uh, several reviews uh, viewed uh, 350, 600 uh, different uh, times. And lastly, on a personal note, uh, Louise was on my appointment panel uh, when I was hired here. Um, and she's been a mentor and uh, a friend uh, for the last uh, five years. And it's really just a privilege to listen to her today. Uh, with that, I'll mute. Thank you very much, Bernadette. I'm glad you didn't give away too many secrets there. Um, I'm really pleased everyone to be here and be able to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing um, that relates to our research on breakfast. I particularly want to acknowledge Katie Adolphus, who is the postdoc who has done an awful lot of this research with me. So just a reminder then that um, food insecurity in the UK, it's not well measured, but the UNICEF questions, which we'll probably come back to later about food insecurity, include this one, worrying about the ability to obtain food, right through to severe food insecurity, experiencing hunger. Um, in 2017, UNICEF reported that 10% of the children in the UK were living in households affected by severe food insecurity. So this is not a third world problem. This is also a first world problem. And this is a, a, just an article from The Guardian from 2018. So pre-COVID, we didn't know COVID was going to happen when this article was published. And that was the um, a study from the Social Metrics Commission finding four and a half million children living in poverty. So it's nothing new. It's probably got worse. And I want to try and talk about the effects of austerity and how they relate to some of the research that we've done, particularly looking at school breakfasts. So why am I interested in breakfast? Um, I'm interested in um, the effect of nutrition on cognition, so as well as your psychological health and well-being. But in particular, if we think about cognition and we think about children, children have a higher brain glucose metabolism and it only reaches the level of an adult um, at around 16 to 18 years of age. So until that point, they're requiring twice as much, 200% of the energy for the brain, its metabolism of other than adults. Um, children also should have a longer overnight fast, so they are more likely to have depleted glycogen stores when they wake in the morning. And um, breakfast is actually modifiable behaviour. It's very easy to say to people, change this, change that. It's, it's much more difficult to actually get them to make those changes. So behavioural uh, dietary changes that we can instigate in childhood tend to stay with us into adulthood. So if we can introduce breakfast as a dietary behavior, then it's likely that people who consume breakfast as a child will continue to do so as an adult. And there are health benefits of that as well as cognitive benefits. So we've looked, I'm gonna focus particularly on the things that are ecologically valid evidence. We've done lots of research looking at the impact of, of breakfast, different breakfasts in a laboratory situation by getting people in, feeding them. You may have even taken part in some of those studies and looking um, at impact on carefully measured cognitive outcomes. But those are not necessarily translated to a school or a learning environment. So I'm going to focus today on things that are relevant to our academic performance in both children and adolescents. And one of the first things that we did as part of Katie's PhD was to systematically review that evidence. So all the papers that I'm showing today are open access. This one is on the effects of breakfast on behaviour in the classroom, because that could influence academic performance and the actual academic outcomes in children and adolescents. And as, as Bernadette says, this two star ref paper has been looked at over 400,000 times. Well, that's good enough for me. Um, what we do in that, um, in that study is look at the 15 studies that have looked at associations between habitual breakfast consumption and academic outcomes. So these are associations, these are not causal studies. And what we see from that evidence is a positive association between habitual breakfast consumption and academic performance. So the frequency of habitual consumption is positively associated with academic performance, greater impact, greater intake, more a better academic performance. And there is some evidence that the quality or the composition of that habitual breakfast is also related to academic performance. The evidence seemed to be also subject specific. So 
um, studies that use maths grades or test scores showed more effect of that habitual performance and it's consistent against um, all uh, across across all socio-demographics groups so it wasn't different in middle class working class higher higher income families um, the other way we could deliver breakfast is through school breakfast programs and so we looked at the long-term effects of school breakfast programs in a series of 10 studies and what those show is that school providing breakfast to children at school in this organized way can have a positive impact on children's academic performance but the studies are actually quite mixed it's very difficult to do good quality studies it's very hard for example to standardize what children eat in those situations and it's also because they're in a group situation difficult to attribute the effects directly to the breakfast meal. And the advantageous effects that have been seen are not universal. They depend on the type of school and on the kind of school breakfast model. But one thing is very clear. If you offer children breakfast at school, you increase attendance and you increase attendance of more vulnerable children. So there is a motivating thing there. And if you couple that with the impact on maths and arithmetic and those kind of educational outcomes, they're the sort of subjects where being there matters. So, you know, for me, whether it's nutritional or through attendance, it's a very important thing to do to encourage children into school and then to be able to connect with those children and improve their learning. So other studies then, more recent studies of the um, benefits of school breakfast programmes include a, a piece of research done by the Educa Educational Endowment Foundation and the Institute for Fiscal Studies a couple of years ago, where they were able to show that in key stage one pupils in schools that had a universal free school breakfast provision, they made an additional two months of academic progress. So quite important, one of the underpinning bits of evidence for the Magic Breakfast National School Breakfast Program. And we've said the programs improve maths and arithmetic. They also have wider benefits. So effects on physical growth and cognitive performance in disadvantaged children, but also social development. And in those, in the, in those kind of domains, the effects are much more pronounced in deprived areas. As I said, we've shown in our lab that breakfast consumption versus no consumption um, has a short term beneficial effect on cognitive function measured within four hours post ingestion. So yes, morning I had a Weetabix. Yeah, so it's like I'm not advertising Weetabix, but I'm saying having breakfast should improve your performance during that morning. And I think that's quite important when we think about what happens during a school day. And then habitual performance, we've said better academic, um, associated with better academic performance, but that these effects need to be treated with some caution. We do need some further observational studies and some well-controlled RCTs to verify what the direction there is and what those confounds are. So if we move into then looking at, well, what does that mean in the real world? What kind of impact could this have? Uh, this is a very recent figure um, that shows the areas of deprivation, of most deprivation across England quite a bit in the north with some fairly blue patches up where we are and thereabouts. Um, what we know about kids in those areas of high deprivation is that they have limited future attainment and less educational progression. Schools in areas of high deprivation send fewer children to higher education. And we also know that that is often coupled with higher rates of childhood obesity, poor dental health and child poverty. Free school meals then um, a provision to try and improve the nutritional intake of kids from low SES backgrounds or particularly, particularly poor backgrounds are linked to educational attainment. And free school meal recipients have lower attainment than their peers who don't receive free school meals. And that was a study that was done by Durham University um, for the Greggs Foundation. We've also, Katie and I have also published recently a study where we looked at um, adolescents coming into open days um, and ask them about their breakfast consumption. Kids who ate, adolescents who ate breakfast regularly achieved on average two GCSE grade, grades higher than children than adolescents who rarely ate breakfast. So some links there. And I'm not saying that's about the breakfast. It may also be about discipline, regularity, things that are going on in the home. So if, if, if someone at the, in the home is regularly preparing breakfast for a child or an adolescent, they might also be you know, helping with the homework, 
making sure they get up on time, making sure they've got the right sort of kit. So it, having that regular breakfast could be a proxy for other behaviours. It's not simply about the nutrition. So I want to show you and I'd like you to experience just to look into someone's life. So I'm going to play this video if I can. So I hope that kind of gave people a bit of insight. I think that's a situation that is occurring more and more. Obviously, kids aren't at school at the moment, um, but it's definitely something that is increasing. And you can see, as we said, we don't know the reasons why that child's hungry. We could attribute, make all sorts of assumptions, but it's very important then that we are aware of the rates of food insecurity and how that could have an impact. One of the things I was going to say something about was the National School Breakfast Programme. So this is something that was being um, funded by the Department for Education. It's delivered by Magic Breakfast and a charity. They started out with an initial funding of 23 million. Um, and it's, it's really targeting the most disadvantaged area, areas of England. Um, kids are eligible if 50% of the pupils fall within the most disadvantaged bands of the government's Idaki scale, and that school doesn't have existing prov provision or the provision has scope for improvement. Um, and they offer you know, support to deliver a free, healthy breakfast to schools, as long as as well as a startup grant. So, um, we they they used some of our research, as Bernadette said, to um, demonstrate the impact of breakfast on academic outcomes and in-class behaviour at um, a Commons Policy Roundtable. And Katie's there presenting that. That campaign was successful in January 2020. Before we realised that we were going to go into lockdown, they were given an extension. Um, to the original contract to run until March 2021 and that enabled funding to go out to 650 more schools. And they, they continued to operate so they delivered home packs to schools, schools handled the distribution, parents came into schools to collect the breakfast packs or the teaching staff delivered them to homes directly so that money didn't go to waste. Um, Shropshire um, Council was a council that didn't really um, get very much from the National School Breakfast Programme, they were quite underrepresented because most of their schools didn't meet the criteria to receive that. But they're actually an area where um, academic outcomes are particularly poor. They're largely rural, 
So their catchment areas never met that criteria because they were so huge and the, the poverty was kind of blended. But they also have higher neglect as an area than Leeds, Manchester or even London. Um, we know that during lockdown, domestic violence rates in Shropshire actually fell from something like 450 reports per month to 56. And we think that that's because of the, the nature of the rural environment. So um, domestic violence didn't go away, it probably just went underground and wasn't able to be reported. But kids were at home during this period. So working closely with Shropshire Council, we um, designed a, an intervention that would welcome children back to school. I'm gonna talk more about the breakfast intervention that we did, but it was coupled with a psychological intervention that was to reduce anxiety. So we wanted to mitigate the impact of and the school closures on health and well-being, provide this nutritional jumpstart, but also provide an anxiety reduce, reduction uh, problem to prevent escalation, to welcome kids back into school and to support re resilience and avoid referrals to their very overstretched CAM service. So we came up with this breakfast boost intervention, working, you know, co-designing this with Shropshire Council. Uh, we wanted to address the effects on hung effects on cognition and hunger and to make a return to school experience that was nurturing and that would bring in those children that um, perhaps were more reluctant to return to school for all kinds of reasons. We were we tried to get government funding. We tried to get grant to do this intervention and we weren't successful, but we did it anyway. And we did it with the huge collaborative effort of our partners. So Bagel Nash, who people might know in Leeds, donated their magic breakfast bagel. We had cash donations from Bid Food. The schools had a well used their well-being grants, the council's own catering services and the co-op all helped to deliver this. So it had to be scaled down. We had planned for the whole of Shropshire and the whole of Shropshire Shropshire did get the psychological intervention, but we looked at four schools, two primary and two secondary, each in rural and urban areas, and we delivered for two weeks every day a universally free nutrient-rich breakfast at the start of term. So that was either toast made with a mixed flour, 50-50 flour, or the specially fortified vitamin D bagel that was, again, a mix of wholemeal and wheat flour to give a decent fibre intake for those children, and they got it with some butter or spread. We had to make it COVID safe. So we couldn't have cereals and milk and spoons and children sitting around in a dining room or a classroom. So the food had to be given in bags. And this is pretty much what they got to be taken away and eaten in the playground or taken to class. And we did a, a post evaluation survey in a subpool of children and in teachers. And I think apart from the ones like some chocolate spread or some jam or they, the toast had been burnt, most of the kids strongly agreed that they um, felt more ready to learn, felt more awake and energetic, felt more cheerful and more able to concentrate um, following that breakfast intervention. Um, we've also been working really closely with Leeds City Council. We didn't include them in this, but for the last couple of years, um, for the last 12 years now, Leeds City Council has run a survey called the My Health, My School Survey. And that data is available for people if they wish to interrogate it. Um, and anybody can make an application and I curate that data for the council to make sure that people wishing to use it get proper ethical approval and so on. And this is just a very simple analysis. We asked them in 18, 2018, we, um, we introduced a new question into that questionnaire and we asked children right from the beginning, the question from the UNICEF and the food, scale, food security scale, do you worry about not having enough food at home? We had 22,000 children and young people who responded to that questionnaire and that's usual most years. And 2% of them said yes. So 2% of them said that they felt at least moderately food insecure using that one scale. And that's bad enough, isn't it? But when you look at the other things that are going on in those children's lives, so this is just looking at uh, comparing the children who said yes to that question with those who were food insecure and said no. Those children who were food insecure were three times more likely to be living with a, um, a parent with a drug or alcohol problem, to be living with someone with a disability or mental health problems, two to three times more likely, to be caring for someone who had an illness, to be caring 
one and a half times more likely to be caring for a younger sibling and two and a half times more likely to be caring for their own child. They also um, were more likely to be caring for other family members and they were three times more likely to have experienced a death in their immediate family in the previous year. So that's quite worrying statistics, that's all pre-COVID. The questionnaire was repeated in 2019-20 and unfortunately we only have a quarter of the sample so only around five and a half thousand people um, only around five and a half thousand people um, completed that questionnaire but the rate is the same around two percent so I think what's happened there is we've actually missed out because of the schools going into lockdown and so on a huge amount of data when we look at the psychological well-being of these kids I think this really stands out and this is that these kids are um, much less likely to enjoy life. So you see the food insecure ch children here and then the, the kind of linear pattern in the food secure children. And they're also, you know, quite the converse of the food secure kids. These kids are feeling much more stressed and anxious most days or every day. So what can we do about that? One of the things that um, raised its head last year was Emma Lewell Book, who's an MP for South Shields in the Northeast, proposed the school breakfast bill. And she um, put together a piece of legislation which, if passed, would provide all children in state funded schools with access to a healthy school breakfast and schools that have significant ev evidence of need, so that 50% criteria would get free breakfast, but also schools that didn't have 50% in the Zidaki Bands A2F could request it and would get additional funding. That bill <coughs> was presented to Parliament in October. It passed its first reading. And what Emma said was, um, not just that she used our research, which was nice, um, but that it makes no long-term economic sense to deprive children of this vital meal. And if we unpick that a little bit and look at the OECD report from 2021, uh, what they showed there was that children who are missing school from lockdown and who are the most disadvantaged will on, on the whole, on, in average, earn th get 3% lower income over their lifetime. And that translates to 1.5% per annum lower economic growth. What we also know is that that increased inequalities in educational outcomes and opportunities. And then some work that we've done Imagine Breakfast Heinz Pro Bono is to do an economic example, um, um, an economic evaluation of the Magic Breakfast model of school breakfast provision for one year. And they estimate if you give that for one year to the key stage one children, that would generate long term benefits to the economy of around £9,200 per child. And approximately 4,000 of those benefits would go to government in savings of some kind. So, this is great. We know that free school meals are beneficial nutritionally and we know that um, in 2020 2.2 million children were receiving free school meals and 42% of those children were newly registered amongst the pandemic. Most parents agree that schools should provide a healthy breakfast club and even Andrew Griffith, the Tory MP, um, supported the school breakfast bill on the basis that it was evidence-led and value for money at £95 million per annum. There's been a report in The Guardian this morning that said that um, trying to um, promote catch-up in children that have le lost education during lockdown um, is going to receive £400 million worth of funding. And people have said that that won't do it. Yeah, that's not enough. But this simple, focused, effective intervention to get kids back into school could well be beneficial. And we kind of need Marcus Rashford on board, really, don't we, to get this over the, um, over to our, our governors, because evidence doesn't necessarily work. And in fact, the, school, the second reading of the bill um, has been pushed twice now. And in an email to me, Hilary Benn said he thought, good though it was, it was unlikely to even be debated. So... Hopefully, what I've been able to give you a bit of an overview here is of, you know, the beneficial acute effects of breakfast on your mental performance and concentration when you on that day, the longer term beneficial effects of habitual breakfast consumption for academic performance and the, the school breakfast programs um, 
in delivering better academic performance as well as social and psychological development, but that those fact findings are really something we need to be a bit cautious about. But I think the real world impact of this is the, is the look at where we are now and the increased austerity and the food insecurity in the UK, which has really heightened the need for breakfast provision at school and the evidence that food insecurity impacts significantly, not just on the children's academic outcomes, but also on their psychological well-being. And um, food insecurity is, um, oh, sorry, that's gone. And that that has real, you know, it's accompanied by really significant adverse life circumstances and vulnerability. So providing a healthy breakfast could bring um, psychological and and academic benefits, whether that's through the National School Breakfast Programme and the School Breakfast Bill, or whether that's something that schools do themselves. So I hope that was interesting and Jade didn't upset you too much. I know the first time I saw that I cried and I was on a stage in front of 300 people. But thank you very much. Thanks so much, Louise. Um, that was excellent. And you had warned me um, that the video would make me really sad, and it did. Um, I think my children need a link of that because um, they might recognize they're more spoiled than they think. Um, thank you so much. We've had um, a few questions um, in the chat, and I think I'd like to start with one from Natasha about stigma. And she's asking about stigma related to breakfast clubs, um, and she questions you know, whether or not free for all would help, but probably isn't um, economically feasible. I think the, the idea of um, free for all is really important. What we know in Leeds, for example, is that um, there are around 25% of children who are eligible for free school meals. So this is lunches, don't take them. And you have to ask yourself, well, you know, that would make a huge financial difference to a family. Why don't they take them? part of that reason will be stigma and schools have done a great deal to try and sort of hide the fact that kids are having preschool lunches so they have a card system etc but because of the school food bill the kids who get free school lunches get a nutritionally balanced lunch so as soon as they sit down with their mates who've got pizza and chips and they've got you know some protein some vegetables etc they immediately stand out as having the free school lunch when I was at school, they made kids with free school meals stand in a different queue, you know, so it was much more apparent and things have changed. So I agree with you on stigma. I think that, but not all kids who go to school breakfast clubs are getting a free school breakfast. Um, lots of them, it's, it's wraparound childcare. Um, so, you know, I think with breakfast, it would be much easier to disguise the fact that this was free. And the school breakfast bill is about it being universally free. The cost of it is not so huge. I think that's a really good point on on moving to digital cards and that's been brought up in the context of universal credits as, as well and uh, the cards would remove um, that level of stigma. Okay, I recognize that we need to be um, finished, uh, but Katie has managed to answer some people's questions. Uh, one quick thing, uh, one more question on how you were able to determine food insecurity. And I don't know if that was completely answered in terms of the way you questioned the children in terms of how they were feeling. It was a very simple question in a survey. So in the My School, My Health survey, it was that simple question, do you, ever, do you worry about there not being enough food at home? Um, in the Shropshire survey, we, we were able to ask that in a more nuanced way. So we asked about being worried about not having enough food at home. We asked about whether they had gone hungry, both during lockdown and now that they were back at school, and whether they perhaps hadn't gone hungry, but they thought that their parents had. And so we have some more nuanced data around that, yeah. There is a tool for measuring food insecurity, but it's a US measure. And there is some work going on across the N8 with Ali Files in psychology and Sam Caton in Sheffield, trying to get a measure that is understood by children. And what we're finding is that actually children as young as seven or eight can understand the kind of questions that are on the um, food insecurity tool. Okay, great. I can see people are still hanging on, even though it's past time. So I'll ask you one more question, which is about um, the logistics and lockdown and the delivery of those home packs. You can't really guarantee um, that the children are getting them. The, the Shropshire stuff was fantastic. I mean, they, they 
mobilised their entire public health department. The schools bought in, um, and the you know some of them were driving an hour and a half to take those packages to the schools and to distribute them. The the buy-in there was phenomenal. And yes, of course, um, and but I've seen studies in Africa where you know the World Food Programme gives a, an intervention, not enough gets delivered. So what do you do? You share what you've got. Um, and you know that unfortunately that showed no beneficial effect because nobody got the nutrients that were required and those kids were like three standard deviations below height for age and and weight for age so you know they were very very poorly nourished I think um, yeah it's it's always going to be a problem about where that goes and there's a big debate about vouchers and free food and all those kind of things and I think you know we shouldn't infantilize people about these things either you know, people have the right to control their own destiny, even if they are poor. And we have to make things possible that are, you know, socially inclusive and not discriminatory. So I think, yeah. And I think no, there isn't a parent on this planet that would want their child to go hungry. So I actually do think that some of those things do get through. Thank you so much. I think that's a really appropriate note to end on. Um, and thank you and Katie for this important work. I mean, there couldn't be anything more important, I think, than, than feeding hungry children. And thanks to everybody in the audience. We had 75 plus people um, at one point. And for those of you who've been able to stay for those last questions, um, we hope you come back and uh, lots more interesting seminars uh, coming up. Thank you again, uh, Professor Dye. Thanks very much. And thanks, Bernadette, for chairing. And thanks, Katie, for answering the questions that saved us all a job. Lovely. You're getting lots of thanks in the um, for a great talk, Louise, in the chat. OK, That's take good. care, everybody. Thanks very much.